This would be an excellent way to measure the universe's curvature. But, alas, we are tiny critters who will never make it to the next star in the next hundred years, much less into intergalactic space. We've been talking a lot about metrics and how they measure distances between two points separated by small intervals. I want to show you what a metric really looks like and how we get curvature from it. To finish out this long video, we have to lightly skate over some heavy maths. So buckle up, here we go! The metric encapsulates all aspects of the space into a compact form. It determines, at every point, p, in the space, the way we measure the distance at that point for each coordinate direction in the space. Thus, we have a bunch of coordinates, and they can be in any coordinate system that spans the space. The space has n dimensions, and we have some dxi or dxj for each one. The superscripts and subscripts i and j are just indices that help us keep track of the coordinates. With three spatial coordinates, we would like to use n equals 3, like we've been doing for this entire set of slides. The double summation sums over all possible combinations of the coordinates. i ranges from 1 to 3, and so j also ranges for our previous examples. We've just had the good fortune of choosing and working with metrics with a high degree of symmetry. This makes the components of the metric really simple. Here, in this particular metric, there are only three components. We could have had nine, owing to the double summation over i and j from one to three each, but we don't have any cross products of phi, theta, or little r. We only have their squares. As you can see, six of the nine possible metric components are exactly zero. On the right-hand side of the summation, I've also reduced the form down to a simpler-looking thing. I haven't changed anything significant, I've just used the Einstein summation convention. When doing such tensor algebra, if you have a subscript i that matches with a superscript i, then you sum over all possible values of i. Little g is the thing we call the metric. Let's say that when i equals 1, that coordinate is now assigned to little r. And when i equals 2, that's theta, and i equals 3, that's phi. This metric only has non-zero values for g11, g22, and g33, which correspond to grr, g theta theta, and g55. Notice the values of g for each of its components vary from point to point, specifically for differing values of little r and theta. The coordinate value of phi doesn't determine the metric's values for any point in the space. This dl squared is just one example of a metric. We can imagine whole bunches of different metrics. Some may even have physical significance. You can write the metrics however you want, with any symmetries you wish, or with none at all. It's just important to note that the metrics encode all aspects of the space and relate tiny changes in the coordinates to physical length measurements. Let's see what we can do with a general form of g, the metric, and we have to remember that the Einstein summation convention is in effect. It makes our equations look a lot nicer, but we'll have to keep track of this one abstraction as we read along. In a previous lecture on the equivalence principle, I showed how light's path is bent in a gravitational field. I also showed that this path is called a geodesic. A geodesic is just following the shortest path in the space between two points. The metric for any space is given in the upper right. ds squared is now a space-time interval, and we're not restricting it to just spatial dimensions anymore. The gij is summed over the products of the various coordinates, which we are now allowing to have cross products. We can then define a thing called a Christoffel symbol, which is the capital gamma on the upper left. It has three indices, one upper and two lower. Each are different on the left, so no summing yet. But on the right, we see that it's the sum of the first derivatives of the metric, all times the metric itself on the left. Now, we have a mix of upper and lower indices, but importantly, the index L is the summed index. See how it's on top outside the parentheses, but on the bottom for the items inside the parentheses? That means we're summing things up according to the Einstein convention. So, while this is a shorthand for L ranging from, say, 0 to 3, we would have had four of these added together, one for each value of L. The summation convention keeps things compact and easier to read. But why does this thing exist, this gamma, this Christoffel symbol? What's its use? 
On the bottom is the geodesic equation. This equation shows how each coordinate, dx, m, changes as you step a little distance, ds. The Christoffel symbol tells us the gradient of the space at a given point for each coordinate. As you traverse some small path length element, going on the shortest path, the gradient describes the path's curvature. Again, the metric contains all the facts about the space at each point, and the Christoffel symbol relates those facts to the shortest trajectory in that space, called the geodesic. The red line in the box is due to a gravitational field. That path is determined by the geodesic equation. The metric for that space is called the Schwarzschild metric and is applicable to stars and planets and black holes, but not to cosmology. But that path is curved. So how do we then parameterize the curvature of the space, given that we can now determine the shortest paths in the space? Before we proceed, we need to see what these Christoffel symbols look like. Let's just go back to our original spatial metric with three dimensions. We have our original metric components in the red upper left-hand corner box. The components of the metric are only g r r, g theta theta, and g phi phi, each with the values that you see. To compute the Christoffel symbols, we also need to determine the upper index versions of the metric. I've put them all in the purple box. Each of these is the inverse of the double lower index counterpart. We simply want the product of the double upper with its corresponding double lower to be exactly one. On the bottom are the things we need to calculate in order to get all the various Christoffel symbols. These are all the first derivatives of the metric with respect to each of the coordinates. Since there are three components to the metric and three coordinates, we need nine first derivatives. I'm using the really compact comma notation for partial derivatives with respect to each coordinate rather than the more traditional dg, dx style that you see in the Christoffel symbol. This makes it even more compact and for the ease of writing on blackboards and keynote slides. After doing the algebra, we end up with only four non-zero derivatives. Let's see how to use them. With these first derivatives of the metric in hand, I can now evaluate each Christoffel symbol, shown in green in the upper right. There are a whole wad of these because m, i, and j all have to take the various combinations of r, theta, and phi. Luckily, a bunch of them are zero. I'm only showing you the non-zero Christoffel symbols. The yellow ones all have the upper index as r. Here, I've evaluated the upper index m for coordinate r. We get three non-zero symbols for r. Interestingly, each of them is dependent on the curvature constant k. For a flat space, k would be zero, which would simplify these symbols a bit. But k can be a positive or negative number that is constant of the space. It is in these symbols where the curvature shows up. The other symbols, which are principally angular dependency values, do not rely on the curvature constant. Also, none of the symbols depend on the coordinate value phi. These two factoids demonstrate the isotropy of the space. What they're saying is that if the gradient of the space as we orbit or curl around the origin at some fixed radius r changes due to the curvature, then the curvature in one direction would be different than the curvature in another direction. We already know that this is not the case, so these symbols just encode the isotropy in these mathematical artifacts. All these symbols can now be used to calculate the intrinsic curvature of the space. Let's see how to do that. The answer is here, the Riemann curvature tensor. A little while back, I described the process of how we can determine curvature by parallel transporting an arrow around a short loop following geodesics. If the space is curved, then the arrow's final orientation and possibly its magnitude will deviate. Now we can finally quantify that statement. The Riemann curvature tensor is the thing you get when you actually do this experiment in curved space and make this measurement. This tensor, which you can think of as a powerful function, takes as inputs the coordinate basis for the space, some vector you want to push around the space, and the lengths of the sides of the loop. In this diagram, the starting vector is yellow V with an arrow over it. That's the red arrow pointing straight to the right above it. We then parallel transport yellow v upwards a distance dA. It might have changed a little bit. 
Then we parallel transported a distance db to the left. This adds more changes. Then we parallel transported down a distance da on the left. And finally, it's transported back to its original location through a distance db to the right. The end result is the orange arrow. The orange arrow differs from the original red arrow by some delta v, here seen as a little green arrow. The Riemann curvature tensor is the object that tells us how much and in what direction little green delta v is pointed. Zero curvature means zero delta v. We walked it counterclockwise, but if we'd walked it clockwise, the change would be in the opposite direction. A logical question might be, doesn't going back and forth along the same distance just cancel each side out? And that is a great question. That idea is called the commutation of vector addition. And in Euclidean space, that is always true. It doesn't matter the order in which you add vectors together. But in a curved space, it does. Vector addition does not commute in curved spaces. The Riemann curvature tensor encapsulates that non-commutativity into one hairy-looking expression. Here we can trace the progress of the metric through the curvature. We see that if we start the metric in three spatial dimensions, we don't have anything along the way that adds more spatial dimensions. Each of the mathematical tools just uses the metric in more and more detailed ways. We saw that the Christoffel symbols are composed of the first derivatives of the metric, and those show the gradient along a geodesic. However, the curvature tensor is composed of either derivatives of the Christoffel symbols or the product of two Christoffel symbols. Either way, that means the curvature tensor is composed of second derivatives of the metric. That is a change in the gradient of a path. A constant gradient or angle is not curved, but a gradient that changes is curved. But again, what's it curving into? Again, the space itself has a property that we call curvature, and that has important analogies to hills and valleys and slopes and arches, but those analogies break down when talking about spaces that are not Euclidean. The structure of the space itself has certain properties that make vectors change their orientation and magnitude as they are transported around loops. An important side quest to the Riemann curvature tensor is the Ricci curvature tensor. We see that it looks a lot like the Riemann tensor, but we're summing up on the first and third indices. To indicate this, I've changed rho and mu to a. I've also changed index nu to i and sigma to j. For those in the know, I've skipped over the Bianchi identities and the resulting antisymmetries that lightly change the order of a couple of indices. The Ricci tensor is a slightly different measure of the curvature of a space. It shows the change in the volume of a space that is bounded by short hops along nearby geodesics. If you take two geodesics that are initially parallel, they will bound some volume in space. Now, walk a short distance along both geodesics and measure the volume between them. The Ricci tensor tells the change in that volume. Why bother to make this thing at all? Well, remember that we eventually want to relate it, this back to physics. And we need to know about volumes in physics, and very often, what is exactly inside that volume. I've of course skated completely around the derivation of these tensors, and I'm just handing them to you, like a croquembouche baked by a master French patissier. I'll have to do a full derivation video on this at some point. But if you're dying to learn, then I'll have to leave you to study proper books on relativity, such as those by Weinberg, Wald, Schutz, Hartle, or even the epic Gravitation by Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler. It's really important to point out there's a huge mathematical formalism that underpins the study of non-Euclidean geometry. Even current topics in cosmology that have arisen due to the Hubble tension that explore modifications to Einstein's general relativity, they all use the same mathematical constructs, proofs, and theorems. This is the language of space-time, no matter the physical process you're studying. Now let's see why the Ricci tensor is important.